Good evening. Uh, welcome uh, to the Institute of Design. Uh, my name is Dennis Weil, and I'm the Dean of ID. And uh, make, giving you a few welcoming uh, messages as well as the lay of the evening. Uh, this event is part of our Shapeshift event, which is a design festival that we're doing here at IIT together with the College of Architecture. Um, it's this year on the occasion of the Bauhaus, Bauhaus Centenary, uh, and it's our inaugural festival. Um, we want to celebrate both the Bauhaus heritage that is here in Chicago, and specifically here at IIT, uh, and also celebrate the center of design uh, that is here at IIT with a focus uh, on both colleges on figuring out how to reimagine reimagining urban futures uh, and to help build more long-term sustainable. Um, so the lecture is, uh, was endowed in 2018 by the family and friends of Lucas Daniel, who was a dear member of the ID community and uh, passed away in 2017. Uh, we um, have his family, members of his family here. Uh, we have his son, Ethan, and his mother, Marty. Unfortunately, April Starr, that many of you know, uh, is ill and couldn't make it this evening. Uh, the lecture is focused specifically on the passion areas that Lucas had, and that is to have a discourse about sustainability and the systems design. Uh, Lucas was a 2005 graduate of ID and spent 11 years in the Chicago Design and Innovation Consultancy, first at Gravity Tank, where he built a food experience design practice that actually applied holistic system thinking uh, to food innovation. And at the time of his passing, he was a senior director at Strategic Innovation at Salesforce that acquired Gravity Tank, uh, where he managed innovation teams in their uh, Ignite business unit group. And we are very pleased to be able to hold this lecture and to, at an annual basis, being able to, uh, to honor the life and the legacy of Lucas. Uh, a dear and, and many people know him here, many of our faculty members uh, still have taught him. He was a graduate in 2005. Uh, tonight's lecture um, as part of Shapeshift is uh, going to be on uh, the transitioning, uh, on focus on transitioning Chicago. Uh, and we have invited and convening individuals and organizations who will share their thoughts on what it takes to lead transitions at the city level. Tonight's talk by Jenny Carney operates under the theme of Transitioning Chicago and focuses specifically on energy. Food is energy, there's also broader energy. That's one of the connections as well. Let me introduce Jenny Carney before she comes up. Jenny Carney has an extensive experience helping clients engage key stakeholders, gaining their support while also developing meaningful sustainability goals and strategies based on technical analysis. Jenny has been deeply involved in the development of the LEED eBoom rating system. And I, don't, I want to be not too technical, so I'm going to explain to you what it is. So LEED, everybody knows, like, uh, energy efficient buildings. But eBoom stands for existing building operations and maintenance. So LEED, traditionally, as we think of LEED, we always think of new buildings because it's being used quite strongly as a marketing strategy or uh, when new buildings open, obviously it's more than that, but uh, it's obviously a much bigger issue on, on existing buildings. Um, the, so the, her work on that system dated back to initial pilot phase in 2004. Uh, Jenny frequently delivers presentations and trainings pertaining to green buildings, sustainability, and lead to local, regional, national, and international audiences. Prior to joining the green building community, Jenny worked as a terrestrial ecology and climate change researcher, environmental program developer and manager, and community-based environmental outreach specialist. And that's, I think, the intersection with IDE is perhaps less the science, but it's the community outreach, obviously. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jenny, whose talk is entitled Energy Ecosystems, Reflection on Energy Management in the Natural World and Chicago's Clean Energy Transition. Jenny, please come up.
Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to uh, deliver this year's lecture, and I will say that energy management in the natural world is almost exclusively about food, uh, so, uh, so we will definitely be talking about uh, that. We will be focusing on a discussion around Chicago's clean energy transition with a number of folks who are playing integral roles in actually making that happen. Uh, which is not just a technology issue. Uh, of course, there's a, a lot about our social ecosystems that dictate whether or not we can make that transition, how it and when it happens, and who benefits primarily from it. Uh, so before we get into that, I will focus a little more on energy management in the natural world. Uh, I wanted to start by uh, sharing a little information about uh, how I got from where I came from uh, to here. I was raised in rural Wisconsin, very much a free-range kid. Uh, this is me and my siblings posing next to a large dead fish carcass, which is how we do things in rural Wisconsin. Uh, I, I always had a lot of affinity for the natural world and uh, ultimately uh, decided to study ecology and science in, in college and in graduate school. And, uh, and worked uh, in a lab that was studying the effects of climate change at an ecosystem scale on primary productivity. I've lived in Chicago since about 2007, uh, and so now I'm mostly an urbanite who sits in front of my computer too much. Uh, but I very much appreciate in my current role that I spent my early career understanding system dynamics from the perspective of ecology. And I draw on that experience and those insights quite a bit even now in my work. Uh, my work now is with WSP. Uh, I'm a vice president on the sustainability energy and climate change team. And we work with companies, municipalities, including the city of Chicago, uh, and other organizations to optimize their operations and their real estate portfolios. Uh, mostly to decarbonize them and to help transition them to being future ready. Uh, and, and that does entail a lot of work with existing buildings, uh, which are the bulk of the buildings that we have and will have over the next several decades. <clears throat> As it pertains to the clean energy transition, uh, just to sort of do a bit of framing, uh, there's a lot of work that has happened on the policy and the regulatory side that is, uh, is really setting the stage for unleashing action around energy efficiency improvements and transitioning to a renewable supply. Uh, this work is happening every day, right now, with lots of tired public servants and their helpers, uh, of which I'm included. Uh, but there are a lot of details that have yet to be decided, and there are details that have fairly significant implications for whether or not it really happens and who benefits. We have a chance to, I would say, uh, make our energy systems and our economies more economic and undo some of the harm of industrial pollution. Uh, but, um, we have to be attendant to all of the system implications of making that transition and work hard to engage uh, different types of stakeholders than what normally might be involved in such a thing. And so I hope for tonight that along with the panelists who will join me later, that we can shed some light on the forces at play with shaping the details of this clean energy transition and enable you all to participate because we need your help to make it happen in the most ideal way possible. Uh, but first, uh, let's, let's talk about uh, ecology a bit. Uh, so ecology is a study, a science that is devoted to studying interactions among organisms and their environment. And it focuses primarily on energy transfer, uh, primarily by way of eating or being eaten. Uh, it's a science of relationships, or as Aldo Leopold said, it's thinking like a mountain. Uh, there's a classic tale of why systems thinking is important, uh, a cautionary tale. Some of you may have, uh, have heard this tale before. It's, uh, it's a fun one. 
Uh, and it has to do with how when we, we're always trying to help do things better, right? We all go to our jobs thinking that we're helping in some way, or at least hopefully most of us feel that way. And yet we all have all these negative outcomes that require additional solutions. Uh, and so systems thinking uh, at its most basic is trying to operate outside of a narrow perspective so that you don't cause more problems than the ones that you're trying to solve. Uh, and so this classic tale uh, is set in Borneo in about the 1940s. Uh, and Borneo, of course, has a tropical climate. Uh, and therefore, it is not uncommon for there to be uh, issues with mosquitoes and other insects. And a lot of people uh, who lived on the island were, were being affected by malaria. Uh, so people are getting sick and humans, being the helpers that we are, thought, let's do something about this to make the situation better. So the World Health Organization gets involved and they say, I know, let's kill those pesky mosquitoes mosquitoes with a pesticide, and the problem will be fixed. Uh, so that works in the sense that mosquitoes die. Uh, as with most poisons that are broadcast applied, other things also die. Uh, and in this case, parasitic wasps uh, were having population declines as well. Those wasps, in a, a kind of functioning ecosystem scenario, help to keep this certain caterpillar population in check. So the wasps are dead, there's a lot more caterpillars. This happens to be a thatch-eating caterpillar on an island with a lot of thatch roofs. So no more malaria, but your roof might cave in. Uh, meanwhile, there are other animals being affected as well uh, by the pesticides, lizards, and cats. Uh, in addition to the caterpillar population booming, the rat population booms. Uh, and then you end up having a bunch of typhus. So we've traded malaria for no roof and typhoid fever. Not a great outcome. So the World Health Organization gets involved again. And they parachute in some new cats to repopulate the cat population. Now. They didn't actually have individual parachutes, as shown in this picture. Uh, but they did parachute in crates of cats uh, to try to solve the problem. So this is like a classic systems thinking example uh, that I think does a good job of um, kind of pointing out the, the trouble we create when we don't really understand systemic dynamics. Uh, so moving on to kind of energy management in the natural world. We've got three major sections that I plan to hit on. Uh, the first one, getting energy. Uh, so really you got two options in the natural world. Uh, you have sunlight, or if you happen to be near a thermal vent in the ocean or some other uh, area where, where the Earth's hot core is seeping out, you can get some energy that way. Uh, but that's really it on the supply side. Uh, highly centralized in the sense that there are just those two options, uh, but also highly distributed in the sense that sunlight steadily reaches nearly all surfaces on Earth, like clockwork. So ecology uh, has a strong focus on really the acquisition and distribution of that sunlight. Uh, this is a, a depiction of different trophic levels uh, trophic dynamics basically is about energy movement from one part of the food chain to the next. Uh, trophic is from the Greek word trophy or nourishment. And the mass diminishes as you move up the trophic levels because otherwise the entire enterprise would be a bit of a Ponzi scheme. Uh, we have a curious tendency as humans to overlook the base layer. It's not even really labeled on this example. Uh, those are, are the plants that are making the nourishment from the sunlight. <clears throat> Actual trophic dynamics are really complex. Uh, a web of interactions that happen above ground and below ground, multi-layered relationships, and complicated metabolic functions. 
Uh, there's a really simplified version of this that many of us might have learned in our schooling. So classic food chain, little things get eaten by big things, and there's a top dog or bird uh, that gets the pick of things to eat. Now again, you'll find loads of examples that are missing something down here uh, called plants. Uh, we have given the, the significance they play in all of nourishment on life, I think we have a, a sort of curious uh, inability to empathize with plants. And this uh, other drawing on the right is, uh, is from the 1940s where apparently in some sort of attempt to relate to plants, uh, somebody imagined a bunch of industrial workers toiling away in various parts of the plants. In reality, uh, when you measure all of the biomass that exists all across the Earth, uh, and this is me measured in gigatons of carbon because carbon is the basis of living things, uh, plants take up this enormous portion of the pie. Uh, if you look at this little corner here, you have all of the animals in the world. And then if you look in the little cutout of the animal biomass, you'll see that humans and our livestock is really a small piece of the pie having an outsized effect on everything happening uh, with life across all biomass. So, given that plants are so significant, what's the explanation for our lack of fluency in how they operate and what they do? Well, I blame, you know, modernity and urbanity a little bit. There's plenty of cultures that have rich language around plants. Uh, I also blame our evolutionary biology uh, a little bit. So, the next slide, there are a lot of baby creatures. I want you to take a minute looking at them, seeing if any of them are particularly alluring to you. Uh, maybe they catch your eye, maybe they evoke some sort of tender feelings and interest. Uh, did anyone pick the, the lizard? All right, one lizard picker, good. How about the uh, creepy looking baby bird? Maybe the seedling? I won't ask who chose amongst the puppy and the baby, because if you pick the puppy, it does not mean you don't love your own children. It's just incredibly cute. Uh, so we have embedded in our biology a real reason to have a bias towards mammals and mammals that look like us. Uh, but I think it, it behooves us to get to know these other uh, brilliant creatures that are out there in the natural world. So let's talk about plants a little bit. So plants have a really tremendous diversity of morphology and function and they live in all kinds of different habitats and really they're the world's most successful solar panels. Uh, our solar panels, I've noticed, do not come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. They're like, you know, a rectangle of some type. Uh, they're flat, and we sort of point them generally in a fixed position uh, towards the sun at some angle, while, of course, the sun moves around a bit. Um, But leaves will really come in all different types of shapes and sizes. And for designers in the audience who are looking for biomimetic inspiration, I think plants are really sort of undertapped resource. Even great um, uh, efforts to kind of uh, assemble information about how nature can inform design, there are very few plant-specific examples. So I'm just saying this could be a real uh, dif differentiator. Once you get to know the logic of how plants are designed, uh, you can understand a little bit about what their life strategy is. 
uh, where they're locating, located in the world, what kind of constraining factors they're dealing with, and what sorts of trade-offs they've made. Because energy management in nature really is about trade-offs. You can't have it all. Uh, you can only metabolize so much energy that you've captured and use it for different purposes. Uh, in these two examples, on the left we have a spruce tree, um, on the right a beech tree. So spruces are evergreen, they keep their leaves all year long. They are slightly conical, um, but almost they're just like a stick that has some uh, needles coming off of it. Uh, very small little needles. The beech is deciduous, uh, it has broad leaves. And these two species occur in the same forest, so it's not like one is in a certain location and the other lives elsewhere. Uh, the spruce tree has a different sort of long game and a different successional place in this ecosystem. It's like a tortoise winning the race. Uh, and part of the way that it wins the race is because uh, it photosynthesizes for nearly 85 more days per year uh, than the beech tree. And this makes it significantly more productive and over time it will come to dominate the forest. Uh, these tend to be in boreal forests at higher latitudes. And so what's the sun doing there? Uh, in the summertime, it's almost just rolling around in a circle in the sky. So why wouldn't you maybe have in high latitudes a solar panel that's more cylindrical and the sun rotates around it? I don't know, just an idea. <laughs> I have a, a, a kooky and very, very smart uncle who lives in northern Wisconsin. And he was telling me the other day how he uh, sort of in a curmudgeonly manner stuck his solar panel straight up and down instead of at the, the appropriate angle to the sun. And in probably an annoying way pointed out to his friends that it was producing at the same level as if it had been optimally placed according to the calculations. That's, that's Uncle Ed. Okay. While we're admiring plants, uh, I want to consider for a moment some less obvious means of energy transfer. So trophic levels, trophic dynamics is really just like eating things and then those eat, things eat some other things. If you're a plant, you're, you're clever enough to produce your own meal. Uh, but there's other ways that energy moves around in the natural world. And uh, an uh, overlooked aspect of what happens, but that is the subject of some really compelling recent science, uh, has to do with underground activities and the, the fungi that make it possible. Uh, I highly recommend this, this New Yorker article about the secrets of the, the wood wide web. Uh, it is, explores the work of a young plant scientist named Merlin Sheldrake, uh, who is not a Harry Potter character, though he is British. And he studies mycorrhizal fungi, uh, and that's a field that's really changing our understanding of forests and plants. Uh, the findings are that individual plants are all joined together by this underground network of fungi. And when I was studying ecology, you know, some number of years ago, uh, mycorrhiza were understood in the sense that they had a symbiotic relationship with the plant. So the plant lets them slurp a little kind of carbon-rich sugar water out of the roots, uh, and then the, the mycorrhiza delivers to the plant uh, nutrients that it couldn't otherwise extract from the soil because it doesn't have the right enzymes. So, you know, phosphorus and nitrogen and so, so on. Uh, but it turns out that this network uh, and these mycorrhiza are performing a, a much vaster function. Basically, networking every single tree in the forest with every single other tree in the forest. And the, the trees don't just share nutrients with the fungi, they, they send them over this network to the other trees uh, down the way. Uh, so a, a dying tree is being shown to actually by divesting of its stuff. It knows it's not gonna need it anymore, so it puts carbon and other nutrients out through this network to benefit other plants. Uh, a young tree that's kind of got some bum luck and is growing in a very shady area and can't generate enough nourishment on its own might be subsidized by this network. 
there are studies that show seedlings will recognize their siblings and selectively share with them, which seems lovely. Uh, and they also send messages like, alert, I am being eaten by aphids. You might want to prepare for an onslaught soon. Uh, really, I think, amazing stuff. There's other types of energy movement across borders. Uh, so migrating animals are a good example of this because along their migratory path, they're primarily seeking out food or more hospitable conditions as seasons change. Uh, but they're also making deposits along the way. They're eating things along the way. They're being eaten along the way. Uh, so that moves energy across ecosystem boundaries. Uh, a kind of special type of animal migration is uh, salmon species that are andronomous. So they run upwards, they, they go upstream into freshwater ecosystems to spawn. And this ends up being an incredible subsidy for the riparian ecosystems that surround the freshwater systems. Basically all this ocean mass and nutrients swims upstream and then dies uh, in, a, in a different ecosystem, lending those nutrients. Uh, while I was preparing for this lecture, I decided to see what the you know, recent research on this topic was. Uh, so I quickly found this, uh, this journal article on JSTOR about the biogeochemical transformation of a nutrient subsidy by Peter Levi et al. And I thought, oh, I know Peter Levi. We went to college together. Uh, and we worked together in a, a lab for a summer. So I thought I would dig through my old photographs printed on paper and see if I had anything funny lurking in there. And uh, sure enough, here we are as, uh, as 22 year olds, uh, air guitar playing some salmon hot pads. Uh, apparently Peter has really been interested in salmon for quite a while. Okay, moving on uh, to the next topic, storing and using energy. So uh, storing and using energy, uh, you'll notice right away is that plants and animals pretty much are just using metabolic energy, food and nourishment to make uh, things happen for themselves by way of their bodies. Uh, as a result, there's a big focus on trade-offs between different options for energy use while still surviving in whatever niches they happen to exist in. So you'll see different strategies playing out um, that are really about conserving energy or having tricks up one sleeve that accommodate uh, saving energy. Uh, speed and mobility is really expensive from an energy and a metabolic perspective. So some animals, um, you know, they might have speediness as a strategy. They might be predators that have to chase down some prey, or they might be some prey that have to run real fast to get away from a predator. Uh, but if you've invested in some other defensive tricks, you can be slow as molasses, and it's no problem. So I don't know if you've ever seen a porcupine walking, but they take their time. Uh, and why wouldn't you? It's like, what, who's going to bother them? Uh, another example is this, uh, this lizard species. Um, this is a, a sort of short, squat, spiky, uh, somewhat camouflaged entity. It's a horn lizard. So it has all these things that, you know, might prevent it from being chomped on. It can't move quickly at all. And then it has one final trick where if you get too close, it will shoot disgusting tasting blood out of its eyes. So if you can do that, why do you need to be fast? No need. Uh, other types of defenses can just be activated as needed when there's some kind of environmental signaling suggesting that it's worth investing in a, a defense infrastructure. Uh, these are, are Daphnia, they're uh, small water crustaceans. Uh, and under certain circumstances, they will grow neck teeth on the back of their necks, which uh, is, I guess, makes it more difficult for them to be 
uh, eaten. And so this will be kind of generational. So like, you know, some new Daphne are getting ready to be born. They're having some interaction with the, uh, the external world. And they're perceiving some signal that says like, look, kid, it's a tough world out there. It's particularly bad. You might want to go ahead and grow some neck teeth. Uh, another type of energy efficiency could be in, you know, how you, uh, how you work as a predator. So coral reefs um, are actually made up of tiny marine invertebrates, so they're animals. Uh, the individuals are called polyps, and they, they form colonies together that build reefs. And each polyp is kind of a sac-like animal with some tentacles surrounding a, a mouth opening -y type thing. Uh, some of them will just kind of hang out and wait for some small fish or some plankton uh, to roll by and then eat them. Uh, but most of them actually get their food by uh, kind of hosting these tiny unicellular dinoflagellates within them. So they're photosynthesizing little plant cells that are living inside of the tissues of the animal. Uh, so it's sort of the, the ultimate in interconnectivity and distributed generation. Daily energy management has to do with uh, the fact that the sun only shines for part of the day. Uh, and so you see a lot of interesting niche behaviors coming out of this dynamic uh, as well. Uh, really, nocturnality is about deciding that it's easier to make a living during the night than it is during the day. And so one of the things that you might have to make that a reality is some excellent night vision uh, in the case of this owl predator. This is also, by the way, if you have a cat and you've ever felt compelled to leave the lights on for it, it's really unnecessary because they can already see. Uh, termites uh, have interesting way to make use of uh, daily energy fluctuations uh, surrounding sunlight. Uh, so they sort of, um, they build their mounds to have built-in automatic air conditioning that makes use of uh, sunlight or the lack of sunlight to drive airflow. Cooling during the day, heating during the night, fully automated, collaboratively built by minuscule insects with minuscule brains. On to seasonal energy management. Uh, this is where uh, energy storage becomes vital. Uh, so, uh, you know, getting through the night is one thing, but getting through the winter is much more challenging. Uh, and so you, you have loads of examples within nature of how plants and animals cope with seasonal changes in the availability of solar energy. Uh, much of this has to do with energy storage takes, um, techniques. So raccoons uh, will change their coat, but also they make their tails really fat. Uh, I think this maybe is happening with squirrels too, because you see that fluffy tail. Uh, they can actually just stockpile fat in their tails. Uh, chickadees and other types of birds will decide going into winter, you know, this brain is really taking a lot of energy use. I don't have a lot of extra food. Why don't I just shrink my brain for the winter? Uh, I'll go from singing elaborate songs to just making like some pretty simple one note chirps and then rebuild my brain in the springtime when I'm trying to um, you know, seem flashy to a pot potential mate. Uh, squirrels can also change their, their brain size seasonally, uh, but in their case, it actually gets bigger in the fall because they're scatter hoarders, or at least some of them are, and they need to create these mental maps of all these nuts that they've squirreled away. Uh, so their brains get bigger to remember where all those damn nuts were placed. <laughs> Uh, other seasonal energy management, uh, so uh, amphibians are poikilothermic ectotherms, which means they can't regulate their body temperature and uh, they will just shift with the environmental conditions. Uh, and many of these species can actually freeze and thaw several times over the course of the winter. 
At some point, you know, like a polar vortex level of freezing will actually be too much for them, but just run-of-the-mill freezing is no problem. Uh, and then, of course, hibernation. Uh, it's not just a technique that bears use. Uh, certain snails, uh, lots of other types of mammals, as well as amphibians. The snails have to worry about drying out, and so they make like a special like moisture-saving substance that they use to put over themselves uh, to stay hydrated. Uh, other seasonal energy management, um, growing roots and storing some sugar in them. So for the gardeners in the audience, uh, you may have spent time thinking about which of the plants you grow are annuals versus biennials versus perennials. Uh, so biennials and perennials, they're going to come back at least one more year and, uh, you know, go through another growing season either to produce seed or to just kind of live in perpetuity. Uh, anything that is going through the trouble of making a nice root like this is probably a biennial or a perennial because they need to gear back up in the following spring, build some new solar panels, leaves, uh, and, and get back to, uh, to their life. Uh, we exploit this, of course, by, by eating uh, these types of foods. Uh, trees do it as well. Uh, deciduous trees that go dormant in the winter and of course that's where uh, delicious maple syrup comes from. The trees are, are moving the stored sugar from their roots back up to the canopy where they will use it to build some leaves. We are intercepting it, boiling it down, in my family's case placing it in reused Snapple bottles uh, and then enjoying it. Uh, and then lastly, um, energy management for periodic cataclysmic <laughs> events. Let's try this. Good timing, at least. There we go. So, um, it's not uncommon for there to be some sort of energy-related disaster uh, that falls outside of a kind of daily or seasonal rhythm. Uh, and so, plants especially have some good tricks for dealing with this. Uh, leaves can be eaten off uh, by caterpillars if there's a big infestation. Uh, de-leafing, and so a tree might have to grow back all of its leaves mid-season. Uh, grasses might be uh, eaten by a roving herd of megafauna, uh, or there could be a fire that goes through. Uh, so plants uh, like that tend to have some energy reserves that they can kind of call up uh, to rely upon when there's some sort of disaster like this. And it's actually a really important function when it comes to repatriating atmospheric climate back into the soil where it serves us best. Because what happens, uh, once these grazing animals or this fire comes through, the plant's moving energy from the roots back above ground, and all of that fibrous infrastructure that was used to house the food gets sloughed off and becomes soil carbon, essentially. It can't be oxidized as long as it stays underneath the soil. So if you're looking for a way to take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it below ground, like right there, it's plants. We, it, it already happens all the time. That's how it got there in the first place. Uh, and so as humans, we could be facilitative of that. Um, 
instead of relying on developing machines that might do that in a less effective and pleasing way. Uh, okay, lastly, uh, we're going to talk about ways that plants and animals reject energy. And this is another area where I think there's a lot of ways that we could mimic uh, nature to our benefit because uh, a major effect of climate change is that we have all of this excess energy sloshing around the atmosphere, causing devastating storms uh, and so on. Uh, so let's take a look at a few examples of how plants and animals deal with unwanted energy. Uh, so here's a good one. Uh, kind of big ears and vasodilation is uh, a thermal energy management system, basically a big heat exchanger in the case of this jackrabbit. Uh, toucans also do this with their beak and elephants with their uh, ears as well, of course. Uh, leaves also have shapes that are intended to deal with excess sunlight. Uh, so there are sun leaves and there are shade leaves within the same plant. Uh, so this is an example from an oak tree. So the sun leaves that have the heightened exposure to sunlight uh, is the one on the left. It's smaller. It has more elongated lobes. Uh, this is to kind of conserve water because with all that light beating down on it, that's a risk. It also allows light to filter lower into the canopy. And um, those leaves basically turn on and off really quickly. Um, hit, sunlight hits, they activate, it gets too hot, they shut down to conserve water. The shade leaves are kind of just like steady eddy doing their thing with diffuse light. And again, gardeners, this is why if you are raising seedlings, you have to give them a transition period because you're basically uh, taking what had been a shade leaf and thrusting it into the sunlight. And they can reconfigure themselves, uh, but they need an adjustment period to pull that off. Another um, mechanism for dealing with unwanted uh, energy, uh, these are um, Mexican jumping beans, uh, which are actually seed pods that have the larva of a small uh, moth within them. So. The larva is in there, it's cozy, it's nice, there's a built-in food supply, um, but you're sort of stuck in your seed pod and don't have a lot of agency over moving around or doing things with the outside world. Well, these Mexican jumping beans uh, actually, once they eat out the inside of the bean, they will sort of weave a silk white thread and then they'll grab the web with their little larva forearms and they can jerk it and move the bean. And so they'll actually hop to shade if they're overheating and they can get there in time. Of course, they have, they have no idea where the shade is, so I think they're just hopping around blindly. Um, it's a little less obvious how this would apply to Chicago's clean energy transition, but I find it remarkable nevertheless. Okay, and then uh, our last few examples. Um, this is Elkhorn coral that is found in high energy parts of the ocean, you know, around a, an island or so on. Uh, it, along with a few other uh, species of corals, particularly important for like getting things started with reef development because they can handle the high energy in a way that other corals can't. Uh, this has to do with how they're structured. Uh, and also, when there's a really extreme event, uh, some of the branches might break off, but that's actually a propagation strategy. Uh, and so they're using that event to their advantage uh, to spread. Uh, once they are established and create these dense mats, they create a sort of softer, more protected environment for other types of species to move in. I think it's really fascinating that when you look at the morphology of that and then compare it to the morphology of alpine tree species that are in heavily winded environments, you see a lot of similarity in terms of their physical structure and how they deal with that deluge of energy. So um, just to do a little recap, 
considering takeaways about energy in the natural world, comparing that to human situations. Uh, so in the a natural world, it's highly distributed, interconnectivity is high, uh, really a focus on metabolic energy to use your body to do some things that will also be useful. Uh, behavior change and efficiency and trade-off of functions are much more common and used in lieu of or alongside of stockpiling. And stockpiling doesn't go beyond a season or a cataclysmic event or two. Uh, the storage mechanisms they have to get through periods of low energy are many and varied. Uh, there's a pretty good playbook to draw from. And when you consider that with, you know, humans pre-industrial revolution, kind of similar, uh, you know, doing some biomass combustion to have some creature comforts, you know, raising some food for, for animals, uh, but again, that's pretty much metabolic in nature. Uh, and then really it's just kind of post-industrial revolution and now where we've kind of have all of these different energy end uses and we've found this stockpile of energy in the form of oil reserves that we have turned into, you know, essentially thermal and uh, illumination and agricultural homogeny. We're making everything the same. You go into a building to a building and it doesn't matter if it's day or night or winter or summer or fall, you'll have the same ambient conditions. Uh, and so I think it's worth asking, like, why are we doing that? Uh, maybe there's something in our evolutionary biology that's trying to keep us away from extremes and to smooth the peaks that are really dangerous. But at some point, I think it stops serving us and we're not really particularly enjoying ourselves or thriving just because we've spent a huge stockpile of energy creating those conditions. And I will say, I know I was responsible for choosing these pictures, but looking at the three, I'm gonna say the bird and the plant look about as happy as anyone. Uh, and, and certainly the old timey humans and the modern humans don't have any different levels of glee that are observable in a typical. Uh, so, um, keeping that question in mind about why are we using so much energy to homogenize our days and nights and seasons, uh, I think it's also worth talking a little bit about the costs of energy mismanagement uh, leading into our discussion of Chicago's clean energy transition. Uh, so for plants and animals, it's a, a kind of straightforward but brutal outcome where if you're a bad energy manager, then you die. Uh, so it's, uh, it's kind of the ultimate pricing signal to not waste energy. Contrast that with, you know, middle class and affluent Americans. And it's really kind of like a not very significant loss of disposable income if you use excessive energy. And the messaging that goes out to residential customers sort of reinforces that. I, I like this, um, you know, for folks who've studied when utility bills started messaging around this is what you're doing relative to your neighbors, uh, apparently like we're so sensitive to the idea that we're performing badly that you can't even really tell it like it is. Like, this person clearly is not doing a good job if they're like, you know, using almost as much energy as every other wasteful energy customer. But they're labeled good, good job. Uh, and then there's some suggestions for, you know, what benefit they might gain by uh, actually improving their performance. And it's like, oh, I could save 85 bucks a year. Or, you know, maybe this is an investment opportunity and I could get a real ROI here if I invested in efficiency. Uh, so that's one version of the experience of energy mismanagement. Not that powerful. Like, I'm probably not gonna rearrange my life around 85 bucks a year. Uh, for for-profit utilities, the penalty for energy mismanagement is interesting too, it might just mean more profits. Hey, this is great. We sell energy and people surely use a lot of it. Uh, 
Under some circumstances, perhaps that catches up with the utility, as uh, has happened with the, the rise and fall of PG&E, uh, the California-based utility that was reaching record profit levels in 2017 and is now bankrupt because of their miscalculation of the extent to which they could cause catastrophic fires. Uh, and they're certainly not in a good place now. And then I think most importantly uh, to be cognizant of is that for poor people, energy mismanagement at a societal level is a deadly condition. And unfortunately, Chicago has its own terrible version of this in the form of the 1995 heat wave that killed 739 people over five days. Uh, other disasters happen and a similar pattern plays out where the people who die and suffer during hurricanes, during intense storms that are more common with climate change, are the poor people. And you can map uh, the heat deaths in Chicago to poor neighborhoods, which are communities of color, which are the neighborhoods where redlining and divestment and racist federal policies have created a generational impoverishment. Uh, I would recommend seeing this documentary, uh, Cooked Survival by Zip Code, that examines uh, this dynamic, or reading Eric Kleinenberg's 2002 book, Heat Wave, A Social Autopsy of Disaster in Chicago. Uh, our social infrastructure, as much as our physical infrastructure and our energy infrastructure, is what we need to develop to make sure that this inequitable outcome to energy mismanagement uh, doesn't persist. So, uh, as we move into the panel discussion, uh, my hope is that you all learn something about the mechanics of how a citywide clean energy transition might work. Uh, the social ecosystems that you are and that you can support that will dictate the terms of those changes. Uh, and also a challenge for us to be systems thinkers and to be careful to avoid unintended consequences that might worsen inequality and vulnerability. And perhaps in the best case scenario, uh, we come up with a transition plan uh, that that undoes some of the harmful effects and unjust effects of old designs. Uh, so thank you. So I will welcome our panelists up and give a brief synopsis of who these fine people are and then we'll have We'll have a, a discussion where I'm awkwardly standing to your left. <laughs> All right. Uh, one of you has inherited the bad microphone, so be careful. Uh, okay, so first up, I would like to introduce everybody to uh, Mandy LeBriar. She is the Director of Energy Management at the City of Chicago. Uh, she oversees energy procurement, uh, the renewable energy strategy by 2025, and manages contracts for uh, the $150 million that the city spends on energy and fuel for public buildings. Uh, full disclosure, I also work with Mandy in my professional capacity. Uh, so on a, a daily basis, we, uh, we think long and hard about how to make this clean energy transition a reality and bring about the best version of it that we can. The limiting factor, by the way, just not to give too much away, is the social ecosystems around the transition. Uh, Mandy, will you uh, just say a few words about your current work as it relates to the clean energy transition? Can everybody hear me okay? Can everybody hear me okay? All right, great. Thank you, Ginny. Uh, I guess you have 
all see how lucky I am to have uh, such an incredibly intelligent and uh, wonderful colleague to work with on a daily basis. Uh, so, as Jenny said, I'm responsible for uh, the city's uh, energy procurement and management, which really means that I'm responsible for the city's uh, energy strategy operations and administration. Uh, so looking forward to the future and uh, what our clean transition, energy transition to renewables will look like, in addition to what our daily operations looks like. Uh, it's overseeing a portfolio of about 500 buildings, uh, all public owned, everything from libraries to uh, ward yards, and we regularly joke about the salt piles that the city has for snow removal. Uh, we also have a fleet of about 12,000 vehicles, so one of my roles is to uh, purchase transportation fuels, including gasoline, uh, diesel, and biodiesel, uh, in addition to electricity and natural gas. Uh, a few folks in here may be aware, although it's not commonly known, the city has a small portion of steam that uh, also provides energy to our city hall and a few chilled water locations. So we have a variety of sources, a couple geothermal spots as well. So we have a variety of energy sources that provide uh, you know, power to our buildings. Okay, thank you, Mandy. Uh, next up we have Ed Miller with the Joyce Foundation. Uh, the Joyce Foundation is dedicated to advancing uh, racial equity and economic mobility in the Great Lakes region. Uh, and uh, one aspect of that has to do with environmental programs with which Ed directs. So could you tell us just a little bit about what you're currently working on related to the clean energy transition? You bet. Thank you. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for being here tonight. Uh, so the Joyce Foundation works uh, to try to improve public policies in a range of areas uh, in the, the Great Lakes region. Uh, we work at, at the city level uh, here in Chicago, and we also work at the state level from Minnesota through uh, Ohio. Uh, and uh, we really try to figure out ways to uh, work with uh, nonprofit advocates, uh, with university-based researchers, with others that are developing ideas for improved public policies, uh, and then working to put those uh, into practice. And uh, not to give away the next speaker, but one of the uh, uh, organizations that we uh, work with is uh, an organization called Elevate Energy here in Chicago that the third speaker will be telling you about. Uh, but for us, really, we're looking for high-impact opportunities to uh, work to you know, improve public policies so that you're getting more work for uh, less carbon uh, output. Okay, thanks, Ed. Uh, and then we also have uh, Pastor Booker Vance, who is the policy outreach manager at Elevate Energy, which is uh, a local nonprofit that has played many leading roles in access to energy efficiency uh, around Chicago. Uh, he works with communities across the region and beyond to increase access to clean energy. And prior to joining Elevate, he was the policy director at Faith in Place, with works, which works with uh, over a thousand houses of worship on uh, kind of stewardship and conservation issues. Uh, what are you up to related to the clean energy transition right now, Pastor Vance? So right now, uh, 2016, we passed what they call the Future Energy Jobs Act, which was a noble effort to try to find ways in which clean energy, clean water, clean air, was put in ways in which we created jobs, uh, impacted communities, and made this whole discussion about transitioning uh, in communities a possibility. Uh, when we put the bill into effect, we realized uh, as it went further along, implementation was gonna be far more difficult, uh, and what well, difficult in the sense that we've got a lot of work to do. And so now we're working on the second bill, which is called the uh, Climate Energy, what is it, no, 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 Clean, Clean Energy Jobs Act, which is CJA, CJA and CJA, uh, that we're trying to put together, which we're hoping to make improvements off of the first bill. But we still got a number of things that we have to do, and that's why I really enjoyed the presentation today. I would have stayed up in class if, uh, <laughs> you know, I'd had that presentation, because it, it's just very, intersectionality is very important, and that's a lot of the work that I do is trying to help people in communities make sense. Uh, this, when I was at Faith in Place, we did a lot of work with climate change and talking about urban gardens and how do you make those connections and how to help faith communities begin to, to make those ties. Uh, I was here when Cooked went on, well, maybe some of you were here Cooked, but I was on the south side when they were dying. 
and when they had funeral uh, homes that were overloaded with bodies and carcasses and I was doing funerals as a pastor. And so all that stuff starts making sense and when you make those connections, it's just very important for us to understand uh, how we continue to deal. How do we right historical wrongs? And now we're dealing with lead and water and that's one of the programs I'm working on now is how do we deal with this issue of lead abatement and, and changing out these lead pipes which we knew were here and now the question is who's going to pay for it? And the, and the burden should not be on the communities that are impacted by these, this lead. It should be on the folk, the city and other, and the federal government to figure out how to help us in this effort. Great, thank you. So uh, hopefully uh, there's a lot we could learn from these folks. We only have so much time, but uh, form a connection with them, join their networks, and uh, let's hear a little more about some detailed aspects of the transition. So one question I want to pose, just in general, you can hop in when you're ready, is from your perspective, what do you consider the largest obstacles to a swift, equitable, clean energy transition for Chicago? This could be uh, about technology, it could be about economics, policy, human behavior, just whatever is standing in the way. Uh, or the lesser known obstacles that you deal with on a daily basis? I'll jump in with one. You know, I just think uh, from the behavioral side, the tremendous inertia in almost every, uh, you know, uh, facility level, institutional, local, state system is really uh, kind of overwhelming. And uh, so I'm thinking, you know, when you've got a building uh, where you know you've done an energy audit, you find that there are all these opportunities to change operations to save energy, and every one of those requires someone to do something different, someone to figure out, okay, how are we going to pay for this? And the easiest thing is for those opportunities, even when they've been identified and you know they're going to save money in the long run, not to be pursued, right? Because the, they they take a lot of effort. And I think that that repeats itself at every level of efforts to accomplish an energy. Uh, transition and so I think you know it really is incumbent on everybody to figure out how not to fall victim to uh, those uh, instances of inertia and to figure out how to be uh, change agents uh, at every level uh, and push good ideas forward from idea to action I wholeheartedly agree and we'll second that um, so with respect to energy procurement and management in the city and public buildings uh, and what Pastor Vance uh, alluded to about um, equity across the city uh, with taxpayer uh, dollars in public buildings is one of the most significant focuses of the daily operations in city public buildings. We do everything we can within our power to reduce power and thereby reduce consumption and costs that ultimately all of you are paying for. Uh, with respect to the clean energy transition, um, through the procurement process, we hope to be able to develop uh, additionality through renewable resources that will cost less and uh, there's a misnomer that those resources actually cost more today than traditional sources. And recently, uh, if you saw an article about uh, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, they closed a deal last week uh, with the uh, IBEW in LA where they were able to purchase solar power for uh, two to three cents a kilowatt hour. I pay about seven cents a kilowatt hour for both supply and distribution in our wholesale market. So all of you pay that for our public buildings. Um, ultimately, it is the power of the purse, so it is human behavior uh, that if they, you have apathy around energy and how you can impact it on a daily basis with your pocketbook, you can, both by um, in, in your own households, reducing your consumption and uh, reducing, increasing your savings as a result of that. And then as city taxpayers, talking with your elected officials and having conversations with your neighbors. And if you see a light on in a public building that's not in use, turn it off. I mean, these are simple tasks that will save energy and, and reduce the cost over time. So one of the things that I really relished about this presentation was that when we talked about the ecosystem doing some of the things it does, they didn't have meetings. 
<laughs> they didn't have procurements. They didn't have it. That, that the, the system kind of figures out how to address itself, and it has correctives in it. I think that's the piece, like you said, the behavior. We get in the middle, and we try to figure out how to manipulate stuff, and that's sometimes where we get into trouble. Um, when, I, when I worked in the urban garden on the south side, we did one at the church, and one of the things I began to see is that I didn't understand. We did a monarch butterfly garden, so the um, milkweed, and uh, we recognized that the butterfly garden represented uh, the migration of, of black folk from the south to the north and how they began to, when they made their way north, they brought collard greens and other things with them and the same thing with the butterfly, it followed the milkweed. So whenever you find the milkweed, you'll find the butterflies and they'll do their thing. So it's a kind of a natural kind of progression that people get into and I think when I was in the garden, I began to see one year we had some squash and I, I didn't know what squash was, but I knew it was growing all over the place. But it flowered, but it didn't produce squash and I didn't understand why. That next year I had to figure out what a pollinator was because see, you can have good plants, but if you don't have pollinators, you can have a problem. And so one of the things that I find in the urban areas is that helping people understand that they can take some responsibility for their own behavior in their own communities and making change and adjustments. And, and that's the piece that's very important to me. And, uh, and, and we have to do that. Yeah. I think for whatever reason, maybe because we've been homogenizing our indoor environments and isolating ourselves, uh, lots of people I know who, are, who care about these issues like do not feel empowered that those things will make a difference and contrast that with more uh, other places where there's more of an intact civic culture. I was just reading about how in Sweden there will be these walking clubs where people will join their neighbors, walk around and just fix things that they see broken around like a, a sign that is tilted or a light that's been left on. and. The, the power of that is not just the individual action, but it's just like a collective caretaking that then permeates what all of the people stuck in those pesky meetings are mindful of as they're going about their work. Um, okay, I have a dedicated question now uh, for, for you, Ed. Um, I think the Joyce Foundation's mission as a foundation is, is particularly interesting because of the focus on the Great Lakes region, uh, on the focus of sort of correcting injustices, economic and racial injustices, but also having a whole program area around uh, climate change and environmental issues. So for you, how do those things fit together? And like what types of projects or initiatives do you fund that you think hit at that intersection? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I don't think there's any one right answer, but I will say the kinds of things that we look for, um, you know, there are, uh, across the Great Lakes region, no end of opportunities to try to work on public policies that could reduce uh, various global warming pollutants. Uh, but we really have tried to focus uh, in the uh, energy sector on opportunities that also have other benefits uh, for, uh, for society and in particular for uh, communities that have been uh, poorly served by the existing mainstream energy systems uh, in the past. So just one example, uh, a project we've been working with uh, some of Pastor Vance's colleagues at Elevate Energy, really trying to get a sense of uh, which customers are benefiting from utilities uh, energy efficiency programs. So under state policies, uh, large electric and natural gas utilities around the, the Great Lakes region are spending literally hundreds of millions of dollars every year helping their customers to become more energy efficient. Uh, and those have been uh, historically designed to get the most energy savings per dollar that the utility would spend, which on its surface uh, makes a lot of sense. But it turns out that wealthier people can afford to pay for more of the cost of, say, a new furnace and might only need a small uh, incentive to pick the most efficient furnace over a much less efficient furnace. So those energy efficiency dollars that everyone has been paying in on their uh, electric bills actually flow disproportionately in many Midwest states to higher uh, income customers. Uh, and so you actually have to go in and specifically redesign the policies to make sure that lower income customers 
are benefiting at least as much as they're putting in, if not more than they're putting in, since they're, of course, the ones who are the most vulnerable to high, uh, high utility bills. Uh, and so that's just one example. And sometimes you just have to do that research to show the unintended consequence of how a policy was originally designed, so then you can make a, uh, a case for how it ought to be improved. But, but that's really what we look for yeah. more than anything, is that overlap between the, uh, the, the climate solution and a human solution. Uh, that's interesting because you kind of see that same problem play out in commercial buildings. So the utilities responsible for doling out these efficiency incentives, everybody has to pay in, but their logic is it's uh, much more efficient for us to go to the largest buildings that are the largest consumers and have the biggest, most expensive equipment. So let's do that. Uh, well, who owns those buildings? Those are the fanciest buildings the most profitable buildings. So you're, everybody is subsidizing the efficiency gains of the uh, people that already have the most resources. That's, that's a bummer. <laughs> um, so the, the um, well, let me just jump in on that, because I think the good news is that things like the Future Energy Jobs Act that Pastor Vance mentioned, um, for the first time, put rules in place to try to make sure that that didn't happen mm -hmm. uh, moving forward in Illinois, at least among residential customers. There's no set of rules on the business side, but at least uh, for residential utility customers. Moving forward, that uh, historic pattern is not being replicated. So uh, that's at least a little bit of a good news. Let's piece. make an agreement to tackle it on the commercial side, too. I think we can do it. Um, so speaking of energy efficiency, a uh, very important energy management strategy in the natural world. Uh, I saw just today on LinkedIn this silly debate where somebody was saying energy efficiency doesn't work. We just have to focus exclusively on developing renewables. And I was like, that's interesting. So because we couldn't do the thing known to be effective and economically viable for three or four decades, let's jump towards some completely untested, unprecedented solution that is at least equally difficult, if not more, um, showing some bias towards a, you know, a multi-pronged solution here. Um, but by most counts, energy efficiency has to be a core part of a clean energy transaction transition for a lot of year reasons, but investment in efficiency in the U.S. is lower today than it was a decade ago, even though we're on the tail end of a gigantic uh, economic expansion. So how do you explain that, and what are the implications when we don't have efficiency as an aspect of our strategy? That question is solely directed at me. <laughs> um, so, well, first and foremost, I think, and, and Jenny knows this, uh, the fact that energy efficiency incentives don't work is uh, also a misnomer. Uh, the city, before I joined the city, actually the city had started a project with uh, Retrofit One. Some of you may have heard of Retrofit One. And the city obtained nearly $4 million in savings over uh, 60 buildings between 2014 and 2016, which we're continuing to monitor that project and are looking towards a second Retrofit 2 project. So we know that it does in fact save dollars. Um, what do, why is it that they, there is uh, an inclination towards not in, in including energy efficiency as part of an energy management portfolio? Well, I mean, the market answers that for us on a daily basis. Uh, you know, fossil fuel is cheap. Uh, coal is getting more expensive, but generally speaking, electricity and natural gas are cheap. And currently, they're not provided by renewable resources uh, at large or as a whole on 100% scale. So when the market is telling you that you can buy cheap power, uh, then you take power for granted. Uh, you leave lights on and you don't make the behavioral changes until it impacts your pocketbook. Or in the case of commercial users, it impacts your 
annual budget. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm thinking about my annual budget every day. It's $150 million. It's $75 million for uh, electricity alone, and you all are paying for it. I think you've heard me say that tonight. So when I look at market prices and they go like this for electricity, I mean, my first gut reaction is, do we have enough to power our buildings? Are we covered in our contracts over time? Is this going to impact uh, city taxpayers in a negative way? So that is what I think answers why energy efficiency is not an area of focus. The implications over the long run, um, well, it's divestment in, for, in portfolios. And what I mean by that specifically is uh, social portfolios. I mean. The, it, the investment in renewable energy, a clean energy transition, and even energy efficiency translate and equals to jobs, plain and simple. So if we are successful in moving renewables forward and moving an energy efficiency management portfolio forward in commercial, industrial, and residential industries, we are creating job growth in the United States here locally in Chicago. It's that simple. Yeah. I think, just, um, I'm sorry, I just should add, it goes back to the inertia or the apathy or the human behavior that it's your, it's your individual pocketbook where you can obviously make a direct impact, but it's your voice. If you're standing up saying in your neighborhoods, to your neighbors, to your aldermen, I wanna see this happen in city buildings citywide, that is how these effects take place. Yeah, I think um, you know, one of the other things to relay, so the city has, a commitment for public buildings by 2025. The city will meet that goal, but how they meet that goal really makes a difference. Because on the one hand, you can just buy a bunch of renewable energy credits from a Texas wind farm. All of that economic development and all of those Chicago dollars go to Texas. Uh, you could instead uh, have an approach that involves energy efficiency, which is inherently going to be uh, some amount of local jobs on the, the labor and the construction side, maybe more local jobs if we incubate some manufacturing related to the technologies. Uh, and then same on the renewables, if those utility scale wind and solar farms are in Illinois and they make use of Chicago-based manufacturers and innovators, then that money stays in our economy and we have a lot of additional benefits besides just meeting the 2025 goal. Who will decide which of those paths are taken? Well, it's really like up to how clever Mandy is on any given day, but it's also for Chicago citizens to start sending some signals about which of those two versions they want to see. And, you know, doing that outreach to public officials to have a voice in that transition. Um, okay, I want to ask Pastor Vance. Um, you know, it's not that common for large sectors of the economy to be remade. Uh, this is a very unusual opportunity uh, before us. And so I'm curious from your perspective, doing community-based work and work around equitable access to the clean energy economy, uh, how do you see this transition as an opportunity for environmental and so social justice outcomes? So the conversation that we've always talked about is behavior and people's uh, desire to make this push. Um, I think there's a couple of myths that I struggle with and I've struggled with as being in the environment. I was in the faith community. I'm still in the faith community, but I was in the faith community for many years. And then when I got in the environmental community, there was a lie going around that black and brown people didn't care about the environment. And what people don't understand or do not, do not get that sometimes the challenges that are faced in some of these communities are right in the front folk, and that, they, that, that doesn't mean they don't care about the environment, but when you talk about the violence, when you talk about lead, when you talk about schools, those things are more pressing at particular points, and so the question is how do you help make sure that they can figure out how to do both and not either or, and, and, the, and the myth causes problems because, you know, it seems to be a liberal kind of piece that goes on. So, so when the Fiji is being passed, it means that it's sometimes we have to do difficult things like working with IBEW or the unions, um, there's a, it's not a myth, it's the truth that some of the unions have been problematic in African American communities in the sense that folk have been hired, but then there are ways in which they're excluded 
uh, in the way in which they carry out policies. And nobody wants to kind of say it, but then when we have these conversations about jobs and so forth, the unions want to get their jobs first, but there are not a lot of brown and black people in the unions and so forth. And so we begin to deal. So like, for example, um, solar has both community solar and they have what you call residential solar. Uh, there are not very many projects going on in residential areas, and it has to do with this conversation you're having about energy efficiency, that you can't put solar on a roof in the city if the energy efficiency work is not done so that they can sustain what you're about to do. So that means that some of the whole transition has to go on. But community solar can happen pretty much anywhere, but they're doing it mostly in rural areas where they're selling land. I'm, I'm trying not to make this complicated. But one of the things that just happened is that it's a statewide program. This feature piece is statewide. And my point is with the metropolitan notion that we can move people and move jobs and move folk. So like, for example, we had a building downstate that had solar put on it. Well, then we put it on, it was one of our liberal groups that was supposed to be doing X, Y, and Z. And so then I called and I said, well, you know, we got a graduating class out of the south side of Chicago. Can we put them in a car, send them down to, to this place in Springfield and help them put it on so you'll have a diverse workforce? Well, the unions, you know, they're not really, you know, and I said, what do you mean the unions are whatever? Well, and I've seen this same person fight in Springfield tooth and nail about something. But then when it came to something simple, like bringing five people down to even just do demo. You know, I like HGTV where they do demo, you know. <laughs> you can get some black folk and brown folk and put them on the demo team. At least, at least you give the appearance that you try to include. Well, we're still, those hard things that we seem to, well, the simple things that seem to be hard, we need to push our behavior to be more evidence of what we're really committed to what we gotta do. So that's, that's an example. But, yeah. uh, so I, I think that, so Southside, we're gonna have to change the whole framework. And that's reinvesting. It's looking at, you know, we have a lot of schools because the school's closed. We have a lot of abandoned buildings because the schools, and they're still pretty good buildings, but they're gonna have to look at a whole retrofit and that all, all those things that you've been doing in other kind of areas, they need to be done, done in the city areas and so forth. And so it's not, we don't have to rethink stuff. We just gotta be committed to make it happen. Yeah, and I think that really underscores uh, the difference between those two paths, right? One of them, provides a lot of jobs close to Chicago, and one of them provides essentially none. Uh, and so part of what can happen with a clean energy transition is that there are different economic opportunities than there are with the conventional energy industry. But it's not gonna happen automatically because somebody is already primed to occupy this new territory, which is the incumbents, unless we uh, convene the social ecosystems to force something else to happen, market forces, will not do that. Um, okay, I want to give everybody a, a chance in closing to make an ask of the audience, uh, to tell them something practical, something they could do within the next, say, week or six months uh, to help usher in a swift, equitable, clean energy transition in Chicago. Sure, I'll jump in. Um, well, I would say not in the next week or six months or anything, but in the next day, uh, there is the global climate strike tomorrow. Uh, and so I would hope if uh, people are either going to go out for the current climate strike or if you can at least uh, draw attention to it, use it as an opportunity to reach out to policymakers, whether that's, you know, there's been reference to uh, aldermen for people who live in the city. Uh, to your state representatives, uh, to federal representatives, and really uh, underscore the need for uh, aggressive action on climate uh, quickly and equitably. That's a good one. Very timely. So I was thinking about this last week when I was reading all this. You got to vote. <laughs> we need to vote. <laughs> because the administration that we've had in place, we've got to spend almost two years undoing the crap that's gone on the last four or five years. And so we got to vote. We got to mobilize people to vote. We got to encourage people to vote. We have to not be distracted by the vote and not believe the myths and the lies that are going on. And so work in campaigns, work in programs to help push the, the administration. And we should always have a diverse thinking and diverse policy. But the point is right now, we, we've got to encourage, because folks stayed away from the polls last time is what they did. 
and we've got to understand that. So you got to vote, and you're probably already voting, but we got to encourage other people to vote because it's not enough for you to get to the table if you don't get other people to the table. And that means working in other communities with other groups of people and not, not in a benef uh, bene uh, when we look benevolent behavior, but in a unity piece where you're walking with people, talking with people about how we're in this together and we're all impacted by what's going on with the environment. Pastor Vance, it's like you knew where I was going with this. Um, <clears throat> just a quick show of hands in the audience. Who, who lives in the city? Look at that. Uh, so I've already said it once. Uh, talk to your alderman. So call your alderman tomorrow. Make an appointment to talk with them. And talk with them about energy efficiency and clean energy in the city of Chicago. Uh, and feel free to say, Mandy told you to make that call. Uh, but I, I actually have two asks of you. I would say the other thing, and you can do this when you get home tonight, look at your energy bill and see what you're paying over a year. Are you invested in an energy efficiency program? And if you're not, uh, look into that and then talk with your neighbor about the same. All right, those are some great suggestions. Um, I admit I've never been in touch with my alderman, and I'm sort of nervous about it. Like, do you just find a number on the website and call them and be like, this is Citizen Carney, I have some things to complain about? Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't start with a complaint, because <laughs> uh, that's often what they, they get calls about. Uh, I would say this to never having talked to your alderman. Uh, you know, they're new too. I mean, we just had a historic election in Chicago. There's a lot of new aldermen, and they're just and they're trying to figure out their paths as well. So this is an opportunity to engage them not only about this topic, but other things that you're concerned about in the neighborhood, uh, even if it is a complaint. But you can go to the city of Chicago's website, cityofchicago.org. Uh, there's a navigation pane on there that'll get you to the aldermen's uh, links, and I believe it might just be an email address. But if you email them to directly uh, and you don't hear anything back, um, call the city hall and ask for their phone number. But don't stop if you don't get a response, please. I mean, that's the point about apathetic behavior. You've got to remain engaged. So another thing is that most of the aldermen, aldermen, all the women, because it's both men and women, uh, they have weekly meetings where they have you know, they open up the door and you come in, you can sign in and meet with them personally or they have open sessions where they talk and people go back and forth. And if, if whatever day it is, you have to call and find out which day it is, but that's the day where you get to meet them. But it's like I tell people with state legislators, I'm a lobbyist also, but your state legislator, your state senator, you want to be able to look at when they see you coming, they know who you are because you have a relationship with them. You don't have to be a terror, but you just need to be familiar so they know you coming because you mean business. We do lobby days. We got one coming up in October where we're taking people downstate. And that's sometimes frustrating for people because you go downstate and it's only a, you see them quickly and then you're gone. And I'm saying that's just the beginning of what you do. You got to do it in-house, in, in district is where you do a lot of your work when having conversations and building relationships. And it, you don't want to punk as a uh, alderman or a state representative. What I'm saying is those of you who think you're going to walk in the room and you change their mind all of a sudden, you don't want an alderman like that. You don't want a state legislator. You want somebody you go back and forth with and y'all work it out over the years so that they, you want somebody who's going to stand up and who's going to have that kind of conversation. So, so just, but you've got to be persistent. You've got to stay on it. And, uh, and again, there's all kind of routes to make sure you develop that relationship. I think Alderman Dow, Pat Dow is, I think, the one alderman in this area, I think. But, uh, but they, the districts overlap and they change too. So. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much to the panelists and for you all for being here and getting in touch with your aldermen uh, as soon as possible. Uh, it was our pleasure to be a part of this series, and uh, we look forward to mingling with you shortly. Thank you.
Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Mandy, uh, Ed, and Pastor Vance for, uh, for your comments and also uh, your call for activism, advocacy, and to focus on quick and equitable, which I think is uh, really what, what is required. Uh, at the Institute of Design, we actually have, and for the many students who are here, we have been involved in energy efficiency with Franklin Energy, but so far we have been mostly been focused on behavioral change, so on and how to uh, incentivize or communicate, uh, particularly on teenagers, on uh, how to become more energy efficient in the showers. I think the system challenges, as well as the advocacy challenges, are something that uh, is in our curriculum and something we, we could uh, take on, and I'm sure uh, have, has influenced our students and our faculty. With that, we don't have time for Q&A, but we have a reception on the top, so please, and I think everybody will join us, so please feel free to talk. I want to end once more with thanking uh, the Mandy and the Daniel family for endowing uh, this kind of lecture on this topic, which as we know, as we have seen today again, is very, very important. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the evening.